Hello everyone, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. I hope everyone's doing well out there. Today we're going to talk about resampling, sample rate conversion, which is sort of one of these topics that comes up time and again in audio and is a nice bridge between the world of sort of pure DSP that we've been living in for the past while and moving on toward more application-oriented stuff where we actually use our DSP to do things. I think there's some nice examples here today. So let's go ahead and dive into that. So what do I mean by resampling or sample rate conversion? Well, it's a pretty simple problem. You've got a signal that comes in at some fixed sampling rate, let's say 48,000 samples per second. And what we want to get out is a sample at some different sampling rate, let's say 44 100 samples per second. This is pretty common to have to switch sampling rates for a signal in practice, but you can't do it sort of the most obvious way. You can't just take the samples and stuff them in at, to a device that expects a different rate because the bad thing's going to happen. If I take a 48,000 sample per second signal and stuff it into something that expects the signal to be sampled at 44 100, well, the signal will get longer because it will, you know, treat it as though it was sampled at a slower rate and it will get lower frequency because it will treat it as though it were at a different sample rate. And that would be bad. And so there's an obvious approach that you can try to use, which is to just sort of drop or duplicate some samples to get the new rate. Um, you know, I could drop, you know, a few samples every so often to get down to 44 100 or I could you know and that's the problem with that is that it's wrong and it's wrong for a reason that we keep running into whenever we do audio DSP which is the Nyquist frequency if there are samples if there if the signal contains frequencies above half the sample rate above 24 above uh, you know the target sample rate if the frequencies you know are above whatever half of 44 I guess 22 kilohertz those signals are gonna get wrapped down by aliasing into the lower part of the band and they're gonna mess you up and they're gonna sound terrible so rather than be punished by Nyquist we're going to look at approaches that get around this so let's take that example we've got a let's take a simple example probably the simplest example you could do We've got a signal at 48,000 samples per second. We really want to resample it to 24,000 samples per second. And the obvious approach, like I said before, would be to drop every other sample. And if you do that, well, the frequencies above 12 kilohertz in the original signal will now be wrapped back backwards into the um, range and uh, it's going to make a mess. It's going to sound some noise. Here's this really severe example of of aliasing and what it sounds like. Um, if I play, this is using resampling code I wrote, without any resampling filter, here's what happens if I downsample from um, 48,000 kilohertz to uh, I downsampled by a factor of 16 to 3,000 sample per second, from 48,000 to 3,000. Um, it's going to sound like this. Here's the original thing and what it should sound like originally. So that's the uh, that's the that's the the forty eight thousand sample per second signal. Uh, the guitar work may not be great, but the sound quality is fine. Let's listen to what it sounds like uh, downsampled properly by a factor of sixteen. Um, so uh, this is a uh, this is a factor of sixteen downsampling to three kilohertz done properly, and we'll talk about how that works in a bit. 
Oops. Oh. Sorry about that. Now you heard some clipping in that original, in that sample there. That was in the original too, but it's more noticeable when the f signal is frequency limited because those high frequency components produced by the clipping really stand out. But other than that, yeah, it just sounded like a really low fidelity but perfectly fine representation of the original signal. We've lost, we know at 3000 samples per second, we've lost every frequency above 1.5 kilohertz. That's pretty low, but the interesting thing is it still sounds pretty recognizably like the original. You wouldn't be confused about what you were listening to. The situation is a little less uh, good if you go without um, any kind of conversion and just take every 16th sample. It sounds like this. <laughs> Yeah, I can't listen to that anymore. Um, so what you can hear is all those high frequencies being folded back into the original. And uh, even though this thing didn't have a lot of big high frequency components to begin with, there was enough that with that much downsampling, you really gotta get rid of those aliased frequencies or you're gonna be very, very sad. So what's our plan? Um, by the way, the same thing happens with upsampling. We end up, if we double every sample, to sample to go from 24,000 samples per second to 48,000 what we're going to get is these jaggy edges because you know the signal stays flat longer than it should and that'll reflect to noise around 12 kilohertz that's going to be pretty loud and pretty objectionable and so the solution to both turns out to be the same it turns out to be the low pass filtering that we've been talking about recently if it turns out that all we have to do is make sure that Nyquist is happy and then everything's okay. So it turns out the trick for downsampling 2x is you low pass at half the input bandwidth. So I take my 48,000 sample per second signal, which has 24 kilohertz of input bandwidth, and we take it down to half to 12 kilohertz. And once I've low pass filtered it like that, if I take every other sample, well, that sounds like the first resampled thing I played you. That's exactly what I did there was low pass before I, before I decimated. And upsampling turns out to be the same way, only the other way around. You can double the sample or fill zeros between samples as much as you want. And then um, at you low pass at half the output bandwidth afterwards to get rid of that noise. And it turns out if you do those things with a nice solid brick wall anti-aliasing filter, or at least as close as possible as you can get to one, then this is how you resample um, for these this case of sort of 2x up, 2x down. So that's pretty nice, really. And so to the details of that, you know, really go back to what we've been talking about, which is digital filtering. So um, you know, before I say that, I should say what people do a lot. You'll see it for people who aren't so experienced with DSP and don't really understand what's going on. Well, maybe I can just average the adjacent samples and then downsample by a factor of two, or I can, um, you know, upsample by doubling and then averaging, you know, adjacent samples to get rid of those jaggies. And that's a thing people do. And the thing is, as long as you're not trying to do anything too severe, everything kind of works. But really, the average is just acting as a digital filter here, just like we saw in a previous lecture. The An average is a, is a low-pass filter, but it's not a very good low-pass filter. It doesn't really have the right shape, and it's not very sharp. It's not very brick wall-like. And so it'll work okay, but it really isn't what you want to do. You really want a real digital filter.
So how do we do that? How do we digital filter? Well, let's remember how a digital filter actually works. It's what we call a convolution, right? We take, to get the ith output sample, we take the um, input, we take the input, the hit in, recent input history, n samples of input history, multiply each of those samples by some filter coefficient, and then we add all that up to get the filter output for that sample. And there's some funny games being played with the coefficients. I'm assuming they're symmetric here and this and that and the other thing, or in the right order in any case. And But normally these are symmetric, so it's all going to be good. And so there you are. It's as simple as that. You just do that a bunch of times once for each output sample you want, and now you've got a filtered sample. Well, all that math's confusing. Let's look at this as sort of a Python thing. What does this look like in Python? It looks like a pretty simple pair of nested loops. Uh, what we're going to do with each sample is we're going to uh, take you know, the history up to that sample we're going to go ahead and multiply by the filter coefficients. We'll add it into this running sum, and then we'll append that sum. This is convolution by hand, right? Uh, one of the things you notice here as we start to write this in Python is, wait a minute, the output signal is going to be shorter than the input, right? We go up to the length of the input signal, but we start at n. And we have to do that because we're using past history in the filtering. And that's usually not very desirable. So the normal thing to do is to stick in zeros under the front of the input signal just so that you have something to filter with and then the output size will be the same as the input size. There are other plans like that that you can use. Um, notice that this is not going to be fast. Um, this loop is going to be, you know, take running time proportional to the length of x, let's call that m, times n, the filter size we use. And remember, we want more coefficients because it always works better. And remember, Python's 40x slower than C, so this is going to be gross. So just as an aside, if you're not a Python person, you can skip this. Um, the, the typical thing to do in Python is to try to get as much of that computation to C as possible. There's sort of two levels of this here. One would be to use the numpy convolve function, which actually uh, takes a slice of the input signal that goes back to where we want. Again, there's fiddly index stuff because thank you, Python. And, uh, and uh, we take that thing and uh, we apply, you know, and, and take that slice and it actually automatically does that inner loop and multiplies each thing by its corresponding co filter coefficient, adds it back up, and spits that out as the output. So basically, this whole inner loop has been replaced by a single numpy call. As you can guess, that might be quite a bit faster. But we still have to run this outer loop a bunch of times, and there's this expensive append and this and that, so it's still not going to be great. If we really want to go faster, we can use SciPy's L filter function, which literally just applies this filter with coefficients a to this signal x. This one here is the denominator. It's used with IIR filters, but with FIR filters, you don't actually, you just do this and it's fine. And so you're still going to get, now you're going to get more C-like speed because really the bulk of the filter computation is going to be done in C. It's still, you know, even if you write this in C, it's going to be slow if there's a lot of filter coefficients a and you have to look at a lot of history. And Python's still going to be a little bit slower than C because you still got to get in and out of stuff and do Python computations and this and that. But still, uh, going to be way faster. Um, okay, so now we've got it. We've got this plan where we either filter and then decimate, which is our term for throwing away samples, or we interpolate, our term for sticking in extra samples, and then filter afterwards. And that works for 2x. Uh, it turns out 2x is just a special case. If I want to, you know, upsample by seven, I can multiply the samples seven times. You know, I can interpolate six additional samples after each sample, and then take the whole thing and uh, filter it by a filter with bandwidth one seventh the original. And similarly with downsampling, if I want to downsample by a factor of seven, let's say eight, so I want to go from forty-eight thousand. 
thousand samples per second to six thousand samples per second. I I filter down from down to uh, three kilohertz and then take every eighth sample and I'm good to go. Um, so for integer multiples or sub multiples, this is great. But one of the things you've got to understand is that digital filters work the best in terms of the number of coefficients to get a given quality when they're at about half bandwidth. Um, and so as we start to use more and more extreme filters, as we get try to get closer and closer to, you know, if we're trying to downsample by a factor of 32, the digital, the anti-aliasing filter that's a 132nd band filter is going to be really pretty long probably. And so that's a problem. And the other problem that we haven't talked about is, you know, we can't have a perfect brick wall filter. Any filter is going to have sort of a pass, low pass filter will have a pass band and a stop band, but between those will be a transition band, some area that isn't quite vertical where you go from passing all of the signal to passing none of it. And if we want sharper transition bands, well, guess what? We have to make the filter longer to get that too. So, you know, it the filter size is a challenge here, and especially for FIR filters. IR filters are used some in resampling, even though they do some weird things to the signal, simply because you really typically want to do this quickly and you don't want to do more computation than you have to. But, you know, it just depends what you're trying to do. But the other problem, the real other real limit that's a big deal is sort of integer multiple or submultiple, right? If I want to go from 48,000 to 44,100, it isn't obvious what to do. One possible thing to do is to upsample to some numerator frequency, right? For rational frequency factors, we can upsample to the numerator frequency and down to the denominator frequency. So if we want to get a two-thirds rate signal, right, take our 48,000 and go to 32, well, we can upsample it from 48 to 96 and then divide by three and I'm there I am at 13,000 samples per second. Fantastic. But of course, as the ratios get closer and closer to one, well, if I wanna go from 44,100 to 48,000, then I, you know, it turns out that that's equivalent to a ratio, a reduced ratio of 147 to 160. So I now have to upsample by a factor of 147 and down by a, a factor of 160. And that means that my working arrays are gonna be very large for this. I'll have multiplied the signal by 147, you know, and then reduced it. And so it's gonna be like 300 times the work of, you know, sort of a better ratio would give us. And so that's, that's unfortunate, uh, you know, typically just directly do this. You might approximate this 147 over 160 somehow, but you gotta be really careful because if you shift it noticeably off what it's supposed to be, people are gonna notice because um, things are gonna go out of tune. Um, it turns out there's some super clever algorithms for these close to one ratios. This is a paper link I found to a nice paper describing how to sort of play some games with the resampling to try and get with the anti-aliasing filter to try to get this to work the way you want. So yeah, that's resampling. It's like I say, a common technique. It's something you do all the time. And it provides a nice example of why we care so much about being able to build digital filters. So hope that was useful. Like I say, I hope you're doing well out there. And I will talk to you again soon. Thanks for listening.